Brilliant. Um, it's wonderful to be here today. So thank you very much um, to obviously Julian for organising the whole event um, and just really inspiring as well to hear from Lourdes about what exactly open science is and why, why it is science, as Lourdes says. Um, so my name is Philippa Hartley. Um, I'm an observatory scientist at the SKA headquarters in the UK. Um, and today I just want to talk to you about the SKA, introduce you to what the SKAO is, if you're not already familiar, and also give you an overview of how open science is truly embedded in what the SKAO want to do. So SKA Observatory will be a radio observatory. Um, we'll be observing the sky at radio wavelengths. And our headquarters, this is where I work, is based in um, the north of the UK. So a lot colder than here right now. So it's absolutely beautiful to be here today. Um, here we are next to the famous Lovell Telescope in Cheshire, which is a really inspiring place to work. And what we are doing is building two telescopes. Both of them will be interferometers. So both will be made of many smaller telescopes. We are building the low telescope, which is going to be situated in Australia and is at low radio, very low radio frequencies observing the sky. And also building the mid telescope in South Africa, which will be observing at mid radio frequencies. This telescope will be made of many radio dishes, um, whereas the low telescope is made of many radio antennas. So you can imagine lots and lots of components make up each individual telescope. Um, and indeed, as Lourdes says as well, this is where this is where open science is going to be a real strength for SKA because with all those telescopes, it creates a huge amount of data and it's a huge amount of data that needs to be processed and ultimately accessed by our community. So open science is going to be really important in that. And you'll you'll see a bit more about that shortly. So, yeah, so we are um, one whole observatory. We have two telescopes in and we're situated in three sites. So we're, we're a truly global operation. Um, we are an intergovernmental organization as of a couple of years ago, um, with a total current total of nine member countries. And we're absolutely delighted that Spain is our most recent member who, who are just joining this year. Um, it's a growing collaboration. So we have more members about to join, but Spain has been there since the outset helping to devise the whole SKA program from the beginning with our colleagues at the IAA deeply embedded in that. So we're, we're really, it's really great to be here today to be able to continue that relationship. So I just wanted to take a step back. Um, for those who aren't as familiar with radio astronomy, what is radio astronomy and why is it pretty cool? Why, why is it so cool? What are we getting from radio that we don't get from other types of astronomy? So on the screen, you can see we have um, the M81 group of galaxies. We have M81 itself in the foreground and then its companions. It's beautiful, but there's a lot going on that you can't see there. If we look at the same galaxies using radio wavelengths, suddenly this amazing interaction is revealed. So we can see through radio that these galaxies are actually interacting and they're doing a kind of cosmic dance. We can take this principle and look using radio lights all the way back, as looking further and further into space, all the way back to the epoch of reionization and to cosmic dawn. We can do that if we've got large enough telescopes. And that's the whole idea behind the SKA observatory, to be able to collect enough light to see far enough into space so that we can image 
the era when the first stars were being formed and the first galaxies. So that's the that was the inspiration behind the SKA. But it goes beyond that. Um, if you can do, if you can see right back to cosmic dawn with your instrument, what else can you do? You can do so much. You can. So uh, we have our key science drivers. We have the things we want. We can see that the telescopes will be able to do. But I should say that the telescope is being built with the aim of enabling you, our observers, our scientists, to do as much as you can with it. So it's an instrument. It's not an experiment. It's an instrument that you will be able to use. Having said that, some of the awesome things that it will be able to do is to study how galaxies evolve over time. It'll be able to look at cosmology, try and work out is the universe really expanding as fast as it is, or is Einstein's equations, do they need to be adapted? We can look at pulsars again to test Einstein's theories of gravity. Uh, we can study the origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism. As I said, we can look right back to the cosmic dawn, the first stars and galaxies that were forming. We can use our telescopes to look for signatures of other life in space, so the cradle of life like planets, molecules, and the, even the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. One of the most exciting things for me about building such a, a groundbreaking instrument is that we, in the great tradition of radio astronomy, will be exploring the unknown. So we don't actually know what we might find with the SKA telescopes. Whenever we've built something in the radio, whenever we, whenever scientists have built new radio instruments, they've always found something new and completely shocking. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we might find with the SKA. And we can also use the telescopes to study our own galaxy, see how it's okay. evolving and what might happen to it long after us. So there's a huge range of transformational science enabled by our SKO telescopes. And again, I wanted to reiterate that it's an instrument that is designed for you, our scientific community, to do whatever you can with it's it's open and it's just down to all the ideas that you can come up with to use it so we currently have um 14 science working groups that will cover the science areas that the ska um telescopes will be able to do again these aren't fixed they may grow as new ideas come along Please um, have a look on our website if you're interested, if you have science interests and you're not already in our, our working groups, please come and sign up where you can keep up to date and get involved in shaping the kind of projects that will be proposed for the SKA. I've put this slide in, I won't discuss it, but I've put this slide in for reference so you can see um, the SKO capabilities at different frequencies. And you can see compared to um, our current facilities, the increase in fidelity that you'll get with SKA telescopes. And that's down to the fact that you've got so many telescopes covering um, a huge amount of area. When you're looking and using radio telescopes, when you're doing interferometry, having more telescopes means you get more detail. And I also wanted to make sure to say at this point that um, while we have our science working groups, while we have ideas of what the telescopes will be used to do, no observing time has yet been allocated for any project. Um, so every single project will be assessed based on its scientific merit as well as its technical merit as well. Um, I've left again, just for reference, the major dates of the SK Observatory timeline at the bottom there. And I just wanted to give a, a nice um, sample of 
one of the results from our precursor instruments, the Meerkat Array, that's also based in South Africa and to which SKA telescopes will be added. So this image shows the heart of our own galaxy. Um, you're looking at this in radio wavelengths, and here you can see right at the centre there, you're looking towards the supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy. What we obviously never see in optical um, astronomy is these amazing streaks. We don't actually fully know what they are yet. We're, we're coming up with ideas. But I, I think this really nicely illustrates not just the beauty of radio astronomy, but the mystery as well and how it's showing us new things. Over in the corner on the right, you can see uh, the remnants of a supernova. Uh, here's another supernova remnant. Uh, this one has been imaged with ASCAP. Um, it's another of our precursor facilities based in Australia. Um, now this image is, is pretty special. You can see not just very fine detail of uh, stars and galaxies in the background, you can see the supernova remnant in huge amount of detail. And this is one of the uh, first sets of data to be produced by a new facility. Um, it's one of our new, uh, one of our future SK Regional Center facilities, computing facilities has produced this image. Um, so really high amount of computing went into it. And um, I think really exciting to see what just a taste of the kind of thing that the SKA telescopes will see. So on to the SKA regional centres, and this is really where open science becomes embedded in the SKA model. So while the SKA, well, let me get on to that. <laughs> um, so as, as Lord has said, SKA, it's a big, big data project. Um, you are looking at huge amounts of data coming through the telescopes. In the end, we're looking at values like eight exabytes um, of data to be archived during just the initial 15 years run of the telescopes. So is it therefore an opportunity for open science to step in to help to solve the problems of big data? Well, we think so. Now, before I go into that, I just wanted to um, recap on the journey of the SKA data through the observatory to what will be our SKA regional centers. So two telescopes, both with large numbers of individual dishes or antennas receiving light that's come all the way from the beginning of the universe, um, huge amounts passing through per second. That light, the signals from that light will get correlated um, and then pass to what is called the science data processor. Um, so this part of the telescope is essentially within the observatory of the SKA. This is where um, all the signals will be turned into images. And the images will be then sent to our SKA regional centres. And it's the regional centres where scientists, where you, our science community, will be able to access those images produced by the observatory. You'll not only access them, you'll also be able to do your science on them. So it's a completely different model to what we're used to. And it's a real paradigm shift in terms of how we do science. So I'll talk about exactly a little bit more about what the SRCs are, the SKA regional centres. But this is the vision we have. The that the this is the vision we have for the SRCs. We want to ensure that you, our scientists, can access SKA data products and to be able to use them to make discoveries. So quite a a simple vision, I think. Um, but Again, given the challenges of the huge amounts of data, there's a lot that needs to go in to be able to achieve this vision. And 
Open science is our way to do that. So open science is really a fundamental guiding principle of our SKO operational model. We need to be able, we need open science to be able to realize the um, potential of the SKA. So our data products will be accessed, as I say, through a worldwide distributed network of regional centers. And it's at these centers that scientists will do their actual analysis on the data. So the centers will not only provide the data, they will provide analysis tools and processing power. This is where the science will be done. They will also support globally distributed teams. So they will function as a collaboration platform and they will support a diverse skills base. So recognizing that not everyone will be familiar with radio observations and giving them the support to get what, as much as they can out of the data. Um, the data products will be archived. So this is a really important part as well. Um, they, we, we are going to make sure the data products are publicly accessible after a proprietary period um, to further stimulate discoveries and verification of the results. So underpinning this is the FAIR principles we've already heard about of findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. So underpinning our model is the FAIR principles very much in play. Check my time. OK. Um, so here are here's a, a lovely logo um, with the um, summaries of some of the capabilities of the SKA regional centres. Um, so again, I'll leave this for your reference later, but the centres will have um, science enabling applications. They will enable distributed data processing. You will be able to visualise your data there. <laughs> Um, the data will be interoperable with um, data from other observatories. Um, good management of data, so able to find your data. Um, there will be support to the science community. Yeah, and and you, yeah, you'll be able to find your data and make sure if you're looking for some data, if you have an idea, you can look in our archive and see if it's already there. See if, that, see if data that will help you work on your idea is already there. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about the science platform. Um, jo I know that John is going to be talking about this tomorrow. Um, so this is where the science will be done. Um, and there are many important aspects to this, um, which, yes, I'll, I'll leave to John to explain. Um, you'll be able to look at your data on there. You'll be able to do the science on there. Um, and there are many important things to do with how the data is managed and how your identity is managed in order to access this. Once science, um, once scientists have access their observatory data products um, and maybe done some science with them, maybe produced further analysis, they will have made advanced data products. Um, so we're going to get all kinds of data products being produced in addition to the initial observatory data products. And we want to make sure those products as well are archived because again, it's really important, I think, for us, but also for science that these findings are available for others to use. Um, and it's with that in mind that we have our um, in draft, in, we have a set of requirements that we want to make sure the archive um, ha follows. So the requirements, as you can see, threaded through those requirements are the principles of FAIR, of findability and accessibility and interoperability um, and reusability. So we want to make sure the SKA Science Archive is a unified facility with a common portal. So you'll be able to just log on wherever you are in the world and work with your colleagues who are also somewhere else in the world. Um, we want to make sure that we save 
um, workflows that are conducted and try and yeah and also store the provenance of um, any data products produced using the initial data products so that other people can then use that information to verify the results or to build on them. Um, we want to make sure we preserve the data products, so keep them, store them, make sure they can be found. Um, yeah, so preserve them for the long term, make sure they're easily accessible. And yeah, as I mentioned, and of course, Lord has mentioned, this is going to be a paradigm shift. So instead of the traditional way of accessing archives, downloading data to, to your own laptop, and it never sees the light of day again, it'll be a programmatic access by um, user teams who will be submitting workflows onto the regional centres. Um, they'll be performing data discovery. So it might be people who haven't um, proposed any observations, but just want to do some data discovery. There will be batch processing, and it will all be within a science platform environment on our um, SKA regional centres. So in because the data will be archived, because not only the observatory data, but our advanced data products produced by scientists will be archived, it will then become public. And the public access to our data is likely to be the biggest science generator of the observatory. So if you look at what happened with the Hubble telescope, once Hubble data became public, the publications produced using that data really shot off even more. Um, so we want to make sure we follow really good guidelines for making our data accessible to the public. And it's for that reason, well, that's one of the reasons when we're now a member of the IVOA, International Virtual Observatory Alliance. Um, and Jesus will be talking more about that this afternoon. Um, so we will build the SKA Science Archive around the IVOA standards um, in order to ensure interoperability with other archives and other experiments. How am I doing? 17 minutes. OK. Um, right. Yeah. So and underpinning all this. So. Open science guides our operational model, and it's also rooted in our foundational principles. So if you look right back in our construction proposal and our observatory establishment and delivery plan, you can see um, this it really underpins the thinking behind how the SKA will operate. Um, and we also want to use metrics related to open science to measure the scientific success. So, for example, these are example metrics we might use and these will evolve, but we want to make sure that the degree to which archival use of SKA science data products are used is measured and recorded. Um, so how often is a product used by others, other people other than the originating team? We also want to record and measure um, how reproducible SKA science data products are. So is the workflow documented? Um, is it described very well? And is it stored somewhere? So um, before I, I think I have about 15 more minutes. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing quite well for time. I'm pleased with myself. Um, before I finish, I wanted to touch on the SKA science data challenges. Um, now this is, you'll see why these are related to open science in a second. Um, while the SKA telescopes are being built, we are busy in our science team at headquarters preparing you, our community, for the data from those telescopes. So obviously we don't have any data yet, but we are able to simulate the kind of data that the telescopes will see. 
So with that in mind, we've been devising a series of science data challenges with the primary goal to familiarise you, our community, with the size and the complexity of SKA data. We also want to support you to design future SKA observations, and we want to drive the development of data analysis techniques if we can by providing these simulated data sets. Beyond, um, the beyond, beyond the preparations for science activities, the data challenges are also helping us to familiarize our community with the kind of data access models for future um, observations. We are able to test SKA regional center prototyping, and this is where um, what's so relevant for today. We're also using the challenges as an opportunity to encourage best practice for open science and reproducibility. And I should, should note as well that um, all our data products produced for the challenges are available publicly for the long term. So uh, uh, adhering to the principle of archiving data and making sure people can access it. So we have completed two science data challenges so far. I'll just leave some links to the websites of those challenges where, as I say, you can find the data we used, um, we provided to participants. We also have written up the results from the challenges in um, a series of papers. And we are now on to our third science data challenge, which is based on the epoch of reionization. We are splitting this challenge into two parts, and part A is currently underway, but part B will take part later this year. So if you are interested in getting involved in, in the, um, it's it will be an inference exercise, so you'll, you'll be using data to infer cosmological parameters. If that's your thing, please do have a look. Um, again, I've put the website link on our slides. Um, so you should be able to access that later. Um, yeah, and come and sign up. Um, next year, we'll be running a cosmic magnetism science data challenge. So do look out for that. And if you join our science working groups, you'll hear about these updates through, um, through, through that community. Um, our science data challenges, we, it's been such um, a delight to to work with a huge amount of uh, collaborators across the world, not only to produce the challenges, uh, to, not only to produce the simulations um, and design the challenges, but also to work with 14 international supercomputing facilities who are supporting the challenges. So, as we know, SKO data will be huge. Uh, data sets will be very large. You could be looking at, you know, terabytes up to theoretically a petabyte, dare I say, for one image. I might be wrong on that. But anyway, huge, huge images. Um, and we want to, during our challenges, we want to be able to provide simulated versions of those huge images. But to be able to provide those in an accessible way, um, we can't really do that just by hosting it on our own um, institutions, computers. Um, we need support for that. And we're hugely grateful for the very generous support we've had from our international supercomputing partners who are hosting the data from our challenges, not only hosting the data, but also providing um, the compute and storage resources for our participants. So. Um, in a similar way to how the SK Regional Centre model will be in the future. So as I've said, this allows us to be able to um, test and prototype um, technologies for that platform. So uh, what we really wanted to do as well was to, we, we're conducting these data challenges. We have teams processing huge amounts of data applying complex methods to them. And we thought, you know, with the support and the inspiration from Lord S and the IAA as well, 
we really wanted to use it as an opportunity um, to, to promote reproducibility of methods and to promote open science. Um, so for our second science data challenge, we developed with the help of the Software Sustainability Institute, a set of reproducibility awards. So you, you'll have seen these in Lord Ez's talk earlier. Um, and I think what, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to give our teams some guidance on how they could make their <clears throat> challenge, data challenge analysis pipelines reproducible and reusable. So we came up with a list of criteria. So we broke down um, the reprodu reproducibility principles and the reusability principles, as you can see, just about C on there, but um, this these lists are available on our websites as well. Um, now, yeah, so we were in a bit of a quandary when we were developing this award. We weren't sure how prescriptive to be. Um, so on the one hand, we wanted to give people lots of advice, but we didn't want to scare them by giving them too much advice. Um, so as Lord has mentioned, of our, we had 12 teams who completed the second science data challenge, but only half of them completed the reproducibility awards. Um, so, you know, it's, it's quite promising that half of the teams did, but um, it's a shame that not everyone was able to do that. Um, but we understand that, you know, reproducibility, as as we know and as we've heard, it does take time, it takes investment. And we completely understand that for many teams and for many scientists, there just isn't the time. So we were really excited to see this um, half of our teams participating in this side. And delighted to see that our colleagues here at the IAA, so our H1 friends um, involving Javier, who will be speaking about their involvement in this tomorrow, I think, um, on Wednesday. And um, we were delighted that our friends at the IAA achieved a gold award in the Reproducibility Award. So they produced um, a really exemplary um, demonstration of how you can make your work accessible, findable, uh, reproducible, um, and really a lot that I learned from that as well. And now, so coming back to the question of how we can promote reproducibility in our data challenges, in our current data challenge, we've gone with a slightly different tack. So rather than, we, we're still um, providing reproducibility awards. In fact, this time in the form of badges. I forgot to put the logo on, but we have a, a nice, a pretty logo um, just in the form of a badge that people, ooh, that people will be able to claim if they achieve the awards this time. So this time, instead of making um, our encouragement too prescriptive, um, we've gone a lot simpler and we have followed the six steps to sustainability, um, six steps to reprodu reproducibility from the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, so asking teams if they can put their code under version control, make sure it's shareable, add some documentation and a license, uh, make sure the stable version is marked and make sure it's citable. So if teams can do those six simple things, they will achieve a um, reproducibility badge. So we hope that this will um, be, yeah, we think, we we wonder what will happen. We, maybe this will make it a little bit easier to achieve these awards this time. So I just wanted to wrap up in conclusion, really. Um, this will be my conclusion. And this is, I'd like to present our SKAO Open Science Statement, which is a statement of the commitment of the SKAO to open science. So it's very wordy, and I don't expect you to read it right now. 
uh, but it will be there for reference. What I wanted to do was just take you through it and just point, uh, pick out some of the sentiment that goes behind um, this statement. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, open science is really a fundamental guiding principle of the SKO operational model. And that's because we will be um, making sure that our data products are archived for widespread public access. Oh, thank you, thank you. Following a proprietary period. Um, and how we will do this? We will do this by underpinning everything we do with the FAIR principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. Um, so that we can make sure that the data is available to the largest number of people. We will also do this by making sure that at our SKA regional centres, distributed teams of people will be able to collaborate together and access the resources and tools um, to do their science. So this bit is, is a sort of recap on what exactly open science is, uh, which is obviously covered by Lord as earlier. Um, but just to reiterate um, why open science is important, we recognise that open data and methods prevent the duplication of effort. Um, and it allows results to be reproduced, which is something that we can't often do, as Lord has showed you earlier. Um, it's a principle at the core of the scientific method. And as you've seen, it's one of the scientific success metrics for the SKO. It increases collaborations and therefore, um, and it built, results in better science because people can build on previous results. We also recognize that open science goes beyond just data and methods, and it's built on top of infrastructures, communication, open knowledge, and even exchanges between different knowledge systems. So what will open science do for SKA? Well, it, the adoption of open science principles will help us to maximize, it's essential for us, it's essential that we do this in order to maximize our scientific impact and also our societal impact. So it will contribute to the de democratization of information and the reduction of inequalities in accessing scientific infrastructures. And it sits at the heart of our mission. So our actual mission to build and operate cutting edge radio telescopes and transform our understanding of the universe and deliver benefits society. Open science is essential to achieving that mission. And this is my last slide. Um, so a per my personal perspective, so speaking personally here, my own career has been a, a bit of a windy one. Um, I came back into science at age 30 after having children. Um, and I just, it, I, I obviously it's really important to me. I, I just, I love science and I want as many people as possible as well to be able to love science and to be able to realize that they can do science because science isn't accessible to everyone and not everyone feels that it's for them. But open science, I can see it bringing a shift in culture, a shift in incentives to guide our work and to widen participation so that it is accessible to as many people as possible. That's it. Thank you. It's clear that there is an enormous commitment of SCAE with open science. Okay. And I think it will be the case for the next year as well. All these regional centers are developed and, yeah. and the instrument is also under construction. Absolutely. Okay, we have time for some questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned, you talked about archiving the whole, the complete workflows of uh, of every essentially job that comes into any of the regional data centers. Yeah. Um, so, it, and then at a later point, you mentioned only the publication of the data. So are the workflows also going to be published? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. And then if so, um, uh, is there a proprietary period? 
because in my own experience with other surveys, uh, yeah, many many scientists uh, are, are <laughs> yeah, it's it's reluctant to, uh, or yeah, they don't they don't follow the standards. Yeah, they like the reproducibility issues. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a balance. So, um, I, my alarm, sorry, <laughs> gave me a shock. Um, yeah, there's a balance, of course. Uh, so the SKA data itself will be subject to a proprietary period. But yeah, that's a really good point about any workflows people apply as well. So um, the um, the aims of the archive and the requirements yeah, of the archive, as I say, are still in draft. So it will be we will be thinking about how to balance the uh, need to retain that proprietary period, not just for the data, but for people's workflows as well. And also encouraging balancing that with it, making sure that people are supported um, and made fit to feel confident with sharing their workflows for other teams. So it will be a balance and it's something we, we really want to as well continue to have that dialogue with our community to see how best we can do that. Thank you. Yes. Just to follow up on that, um, something that we've been um, discussing is that and, and that you shouldn't necessarily need to worry about people finding your, your workflows when you're not ready for them to. That kind of happens when you resubmit your advanced data product back to the archive. So part of the paradigm shift is not only are the observatory level data products going to be available for people to use after a proprietary period, but we are also expecting users who then use the data and apply workflows to that data to then redeposit it back into the archive as advanced data products and those data products should have all of the provenance associated with that data so the workflows that you applied whether that's you know containerized in a way like for the entire workflow um, and that's added to the metadata and things like that that's kind of where we're still exploring on how that's going to be done but it would be at that stage when you're ready to share your data products um, and make those available